Hello, I'm Belkis Perez. Thanks for watching Coral Gables Television. Today on Coral Gables Now. Supplies are needed in classrooms that help students learn. There is a way that you can help. Coral Gables has a new mayor. I have that story and more here on City News. We'll have some tips for seniors on how to take medication safely. And we'll have the inside scoop on the enormous amount of work that goes into building a set for the productions you love at the Actors Playhouse. Those stories and much more on Coral Gables Now. Welcome to Coral Gables Now. I'm Belkis Perez. Now the City Commission has changed a bit since our last show. That's one of the stories that Tanya Leeds is working for us today. Uh, for City News. Tanya, uh, one of the races was pretty close, right? Yes, Belkis, and that race would be the one for mayor, where Jim Kaysen defeated Mayor Don Slesnick, who's been in the position for 10 years. It was a close race for the new commission at City Hall as Coral Gables residents elected a new mayor and two commissioners. Attorney Frank Quesada won the Group 4 City Commission seat, while Vice Mayor William Bill Kurdick won re-election in the Group 5 race. The new mayor, Jim Kaysen, is a former diplomat to the United States government. Also new to the city of Coral Gables are the new solar-powered parking pay stations. Approximately 800 parking meters are being replaced with 80 state-of-the-art solar-powered pay-and-display stations in downtown Coral Gables, making it more convenient these days. The city replaces old parking meters with pay stations with multiple payment options including coins, bills, debit, and credit cards. Drivers must take the ticket and place it on the dashboard where it is visible. The new stations will have an easy on-screen instructions and greater efficiency with the capability to notify city staff electronically when the units need maintenance or the coin boxes are full. These new pay stations are part of the city's ongoing efforts to offer more efficient, customer-friendly, and reliable parking alternatives. For more information, contact the City of Coral Gables Parking Department at 305 460-5541. And one of our departments has relocated. If you're looking to visit or do business with the City of Coral Gables Historical Resources Department, don't come to City Hall. The department's administrative office has relocated to the second floor of the old police and fire station, which now houses the Coral Gables Museum. The Historical Resources Department is open from Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. until 5 in the afternoon. And Tanya, does the Historical Resources Department share the same entrance as the museum? Actually, Belkis, the entrance is on Salcedo Street around the corner from the museum. All right, thanks, Tanya. And uh, we still have much more to come on Coral Gables now. Next, teachers in the Gables and across the country are asking for your help. Find out what they need. The Actors Playhouse just wrapped up a mega production on a mega set. We'll take you behind the scenes to show you how it came together. Plus, learn how to increase the value of your small business. We'll be right back. On June 4th, my big brother was sentenced to five years in prison for a gun crime. That day, he sentenced me to five years of walking home alone from school. When you commit a gun crime, your family pays the price. Welcome back. The effects of budget cuts are noticeable in schools around the country. Uh, that means classrooms are lacking basic materials, but there is a way that you can help. Joining us today is Camille Betances, a language arts and creative writing teacher at Coral Gables Senior High School. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. So, you know, the state is dealing with a budget shortfall right now that's anywhere between uh, $50 million to $3 billion. And normally when we see budget cuts, unfortunately, a lot of it uh, is cut in the classrooms. So tell me what effect 
has that had in classrooms for teachers and for the things that they do? It's been really hard, I think, this year. Um, some of the basic needs that we're used to having, a simple ream of paper, pens, pencils, we really don't have. Um, teachers aren't given a whole lot of money to buy you know basic needs so that's been a huge a huge struggle um, extracurriculars you know technology computers um, smart boards projectors things like that we just don't have any of that stuff so, so are you given a budget at the beginning of the year and told you know this is this is what you can do for your supplies things like that yeah it's very small teachers are given um, what's called lead money it's usually about two hundred dollars and you just they say buy what you need for your classroom, but $200 doesn't go very far. I mean, I spend that usually in a day, you know, just getting the supplies for the beginning of the school year, markers, crayons, like basic needs mm -hmm. that you need. Um, and it, it goes very quickly, and so then there's a deficit, and, you know, I've had to have kids bring in paper, you know, because otherwise there's there's nothing. Yeah, you take it for granted do. because, yeah. you know, you're used to just going to the classroom and then, you know, getting your papers or, yeah. or copies, whatever it is, and, and you don't think where it comes from, but it actually does come from the teacher or the school itself. Let me ask you, though, in Coral Gables, um, you think of it as an affluent society, a community. Um, what effect has budget cuts had in Coral Gables? You know, it's funny that you say that because I thought that when I first came to Coral Gables High School four years ago, I said, wow, you know, we're in such a good community. We'll have lots of money, lots of things. <laughs> um, but it, the percentage of the Coral Gables population that actually attends our school, I think, is very small. A lot go to private schools, especially you know the religious private schools. We have 3,300 students. 60% of them are on free and reduced lunch. Um, we pool for a huge population of kids. Coconut Grove um, is a huge area where a lot of our kids come from, and they just do not have the means to really provide anything for themselves. I mean, they get free breakfast, free lunch, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we have kids that come from as far away as Key Biscayne. I've had kids that almost live in Broward County that wow. come to our school. Yeah, so it's awesome. really just a big, you know, population, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of it. Um, and I think that we get marginalized a little bit because we've been in the middle. You know, our FCAT scores have always been a C, and so they say, okay, we're okay. Like, they don't need any help. They're fine. But I think that's, it's the downfall. We haven't had any updates in, in years and we still chalkboards <laughs> yeah. in some parts of the school. So, so what, what, um, what do you do? I mean, what, and w tell me first of all, what classes you teach? Um, I have ninth grade uh, honors, pre-IB, general, gifted, and I teach English. And then I'm in charge of the creative writing program, which it has about five levels, and the kids um, are producing a literary magazine and really trying to get literature out there in our community. Um, and so I just manage kind of both sets of kids. And what happens when, when you don't have the, the materials? How does that affect your teaching? It's hard. Um, I think the kids are, I don't like to talk about it with the kids, but I've had to make them a lot more aware. You know, I've had to say, um, you know, I'm going to put this handout online because there's just no paper for you, for me to photocopy it. So, you know, go to my website and read the handout there, which I would never would have done in the past. Mm -hmm. I would have always just made, you know, copies. Um, with our literary magazine, we run on three very, very slow computers. Um, it takes us forever to do everything. Our computers crash, you know, kind of all the time. And we go to these conventions and we see, um, you know, other schools with entire labs of, um, you know, Apple computers. Wow. And it's, it's disheartening, but I think we just do the best we can with what we have. Do you think normally, and, um, do you think that it does happen in other schools, though? I mean, you've got teacher friends in other schools. Yeah. I'm assuming. Does it, do you notice that there's issues across the board in other there's places? There's definitely issues across the board, but failing schools tend to get a lot of, uh, a lot of funding. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of the newer technology. Um, I'm not really sure why, you know, I, I guess it, it's a catch-22 mm -hmm. because we don't, we didn't need as much money, and so since we didn't use as much money in the past, our school, then we don't get as much money, I think, as some other schools. It's, my principal has always said the phrase, you know, you either use it or lose it, and mm -hmm. I think that's kind <laughs> of what has happened to Coral Gable Senior High, and now we're kind of stuck. <laughs> well, there is a way that uh, community members, uh, that the community can help, uh, that parents can get engaged, yeah. uh, and that's the good news here, that um, there is a way to give back to your local school. Um, there's two, at least two programs that we know of. It's um, adoptaclassroom.org and there's donorschoose.org. So tell me about those programs. They're both really great. Um, Adopt a Classroom 
is kind of where you just put your classroom online, you say, hey, I need funding, and parents and their friends can come and donate money, and then you use it to buy supplies. Um, there's a vendor list where you can go to and kind of buy what you need, so that's a nice way to get money. Um, donor shoes I've had a lot of luck with. They're kind of like mini grants. You describe, you say, okay, I need um, a LCD projector for my classroom, and so you explain why you need it, how you're going to use it, you know, what your lesson plans for it are, and then the, you know, the project goes live, and donors from all around the country can participate, and a lot of big corporations I've had really good luck with, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they've funded, you know, several of my projects, uh, either half or completely outright, wow. which has been really nice. Um, and then you can promote it, you know, with your friends and family. So both programs kind of offer that. You can email people you know, say, could you just give five or ten dollars, and, you know, make this project happen. And what have you, you've been on it. Yeah. You've, <laughs> uh, you've gotten some stuff. Tell me about the things that you've received from... Uh, mm -hmm. My first project ever was just for basic arts and crafts supplies, you know, markers, crayons, glue sticks, things that might sound silly, but they can really make your lessons a lot more engaging for the students. Um, the next year I was fortunate enough to get an LCD projector, which has really helped. I'm able to display stuff for my students, you know, PowerPoints, pictures, you mm -hmm. know, designs, things like that. Um, my creative writing classes needed, you know, means of publishing, so we got two little netbook computers and two desktop computers, and those have really helped. And then um, digital cameras, actually, which I've used in a variety of ways. I got five of those. That's great. And similar luck with other teachers? Have they had similar yeah. luck as well? Um, I think some teachers are intimidated by, because it is work. I mean, you do have to promote it all the time, and you have to know, hey, my project's expiring. I have to continue to promote it. But within my department, the language arts department, several teachers have gotten uh, projectors and arts and crafts supplies. So I think it's been good. It's, it's really interesting when you go on the websites, whether it's Adopt a Classroom or, or Donors Choose, it's, you, you're taken back by the amount of teachers yeah. that are on there posted, <laughs> I mean, from across the country, yeah. and they all need something. Um, so it's, it's incredible what need there is right now. Uh, and we know about this because uh, here at the city, uh, we've got a board, it's a School and Community Relations Committee, and their goal is definitely to get the message out that these types of programs exist, you know, you can, you can totally give back to your community by investing in our schools, so, you know, that's, that's very good. Um, and obviously it's worked with you because you've had people sign up. Have, yeah. uh, you know, have you noticed that the community, when they're told and they're given the information, they do help? Yes, I think they do. Um, even my students, there was a program um, a little while ago where just for texting in a certain code, you would get a $15 Donors Choose gift card. My students jumped on the bandwagon. <laughs> I mean, they were having all their friends and family text in the code, go to Ms. Batantis' website, <laughs> you know, put your stuff in. So, I mean, the kids really understand that there's a need. I mean, they know that we're, you know, we do the best with what we can. And um, I'm proud to say that we've done so much with so little. Um, but we definitely do need more, you know. All so. right, well, hopefully we can get you some. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. So if you want more information or to register to help a class, uh, you can definitely visit donorschoose.org, or you can also visit adoptaclassroom.org, and all the information will be online. You can actually even look at it for, uh, by city, and that way you can uh, either get an elementary or high school classroom, anything you'd like. And there's still much, to, much more to come on Coral Gables now. Prescribed medication can alleviate symptoms, but they can be extremely dangerous if not taken properly. We'll have the tips on staying safe. And later, we'll honor our mothers. We'll be right back with more of Coral Gables Now. Hello there. Having a lasting effect on a kid's life can be quick and easy. Here's some stuff we've learned. From time to time, secret codes may be used. It's not uncommon for a kid to demonstrate special powers. Costumes can be uncomfortable, but loads of fun. Moments like these happen every day. Lend your support. Go to bigbrothersbigsisters.org. That's all for now. And welcome back. In last month's show, we showed you the importance of having a business plan. This month, Gary Opper, CEP, CPA and managing member of Levy Opper LLC, is here to explain how increasing the value of your small business is also very important. Thanks, Gary, for being here. Thank you for having me. And obviously, we don't have a small, I don't have a small business, but this is great information because you never know. Um, but let me ask you something off the top here. Um, 
I always thought that uh, increasing the value of your business had a lot to do with um, you know, getting more customers, increasing your sales, profits going up, that sort of thing. That, that is somewhat what, the, what a company sells for is based on all those things. Obviously, the higher net profit, the higher the business is going to sell for. Um, but there are ways that a company can increase um, their value and, and actually sell their company for a premium. So what are, the, what are the ways that you can sell for a higher price? Well, three of the ways is one is you can, you can build an organization and you can have a business plan and, uh, and implement it. And the third thing is you want to create a competitive advantage. Okay, and um, how, does a, how do you build an organization, a business, uh, an organization like that? Well, when a company is looking to buy, buy someone out, um, they don't want a one-man band. They don't want one or two people micromanaging a business because mm -hmm. you know, you're selling the business and not the owners. Um, so what you want to put in place is you want to have a management team. Um, you want to have hire good employees. You want to train the employees. You want the employees to work, be able to work independently. And for doing that, you'll, lo you'll have to relinqu relinquish some of the control, but obviously in the end, your business will sell for a higher price. And how about formulating a strategy? Uh, how do you do that? Well, in formulating a strategy, you want to have a business plan, which we talked about last yeah, month. Yeah, um, And you want, to, you want to follow your business plan. A lot of people have business plans, but they're not following them as much as they should. But you want to have the business plan. You want to have it evolve over time. And if one of your strategies is to sell the business at a future date, then, of course, you want to have a, a section in there on how to create value. Mm. And what are the, some of the things that a business owner can do to cr create that competitive advantage? Well, when you want to create a competitive advantage, you want to have, um, you want to have a unique product if you can. Um, you want to somehow position yourself above your competitors, you know, and, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. And let me ask you, um, having that business plan, does that help then the person who's coming in and buying this business from you yeah. because it gives them like a, a roadmap or a guide as far as what to follow? Yeah. Business plans are good in, in the, in when you're selling a business, but they're also good um, when you're going to the selling bank for... Um, uh, for a loan, mm -hmm. you know, that you can show them that, you know, you have this plan and you're going to follow it. But when the business is sold, of course, um, a, a new business owner would want to see the business plan and see that it's somewhat fulfilled. And then obviously, he doesn't have to start from scratch and he sees that, mm. you know, he can follow it if he wants to or throw it away if he wants to and start right. over again. Okay. And any, th any other ways that you can think of uh, to create value like that? Well, there's a lot of different ways you can create value. You can create value <coughs> by... Um, selling consumables. You know, if you sell, say, um, uh, ink cartridges or something like that, um, and you, if that's all you sold and you sold them and you sold, you have good customer service, eventually you're going to add to that line and people are going to keep coming back to you. And if it's consumables, you'll have repeat business and obviously if you have loyalty, you'll have them. Um, in fact, I have a cousin in Boca Raton and he started selling nose pads, the little pads that go, who knew you could sell these? The little pads that go on your eyeglasses, mm -hmm. and that's all he sold. But he developed a very good reputation um, for good service, lower prices, and from that he he's now basically sells all kind of optical equipment to to f um, to opticians and to um, optometrists. So to expand is yeah, and he's expanded into the dental, you know. But really? it was just from that little idea of selling nose pads. You know, wow! Who who would have known? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, you know, is there a certain point that business owners should get their business ready? Um, you should basically get your business ready when, you're, when you decide you want to sell it. You start from that moment. You know, basically you want to start today. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Gary, for being here, and uh, we'll see you next month. Oh, thank you. And coming up next, seniors are at a higher risk of medication poisoning. We'll, say, we'll show you what that means for you and how you can protect yourself when we return. Welcome back. It's common for people to think that household chemicals and other items are poisonous, but did you know most people are poisoned by taking prescription medications? 
Wendy Stephan, a health education coordinator with the Florida Poison Information Center in Miami, is here to give us some alarming statistics. Thank you so much, Wendy, for being here. Thank you. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, you know the the information that we're going to be seeing in your role and we see all these commercials and it's always targeted at kids and and opening these drawers and in kitchens and taking these chemicals um, but it's not necessarily that way it's very surprising actually when I started my work um, as a health educator on the issue of poisoning I really expected I would be dealing with children you know mm -hmm. um, I'm actually an employee of the Department of Pediatrics at University of Miami but when I got into the statistics and I started to look at what actually kills people in terms of our deaths and our serious poisoning I was very surprised to see that most of our deaths are in the adult population and most of the deaths are the result of medication poisonings so that certainly was not what I was expecting. So medication poisoning, what what then uh, does that mean? Does that mean that they're just taking over too much of their own medication? There are several different scenarios that we see. So first we see, you know, I used to use the term drugs, and unfortunately what people would say is, oh, drugs, and they thought I meant illegal drugs, what we call street drugs, and they sort of thought, well, that's not going to affect me. But statistically we know that the, the substances that are most likely to result in death are actually prescription medications. Um, and so, like you said, sometimes it's simply a case of too much. Um, in other cases we see people combining medications in ways that are dangerous um, and in a third case we see people who are addicted or have de developed dependencies to prescription medications and are taking them really not for a medical purpose at all. Okay and then so basically we're, we have the, the, the National um, Poison Control Poison Information Center. Right. And then we've got a local one here, Florida, which is based out of uh, the medical campus at the University of Miami. That's right. It's a little confusing because there's one national number. Okay. So that's the 1 800 222 1222 number. Okay. That one number connects you to one of 57 local poison centers. And we have one located right here, as you mentioned. And from our office uh, at Jackson University of Miami Medical Center, we actually serve all of South Florida. So when you dial the national number, your call comes to us. Okay, and who staffs that? Um, at the Poison Center, we are fortunate in that our, uh, the people who answer the phones, we call them poison information specialists, they're all MDs wow. and they're bilingual. So this is a wonderful strength. Um, by law, they have to be doctors, nurses, or pharmacists, mm -hmm. but we just happen to have uh, plenty of uh, MDs here in our community who are willing and able to serve uh, on that line. So, so tell me a little bit about what we're seeing uh, here locally in Coral Gables. I know you've gotten uh, some, you've got some statistics for us. And is it just then um, uh, just the adult population? Can you break it down to more to a more senior level? Absolutely. We have good data from the Department of Health Office of Injury Prevention in the state of Florida. They're able to break it down, like you said, by date, uh, by age, by uh, even down to zip code. Mm. Um, so what I looked at first was how many calls we're getting from Coral Gables, and Coral Gables does utilize the Poison Center, so we're very glad about that, that people are getting the help they need. So in 2010, last year, we had 368 calls from your community. Community, uh, about suspected poisonings. Uh, we had another hundred calls with people calling us for information. Basically, can I combine these two medicines? Can I combine these two cleaners? Uh, I don't know what this little yellow pill is and I'm afraid to take it if I don't know what it is. So those are what we call information calls and those are wonderful because through those calls we prevent poisonings. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of deaths, we look more at deaths. We had one death recently in Coral Gables. At the county level we had about 170 deaths um, in 2009, um, but the statewide picture, when you aggregate those numbers up at the state level, we know we're losing seven Floridians a day to poisoning, and in wow. fact, it kills more people now than car accidents, than firearms, than drownings. It's really an epidemic in our community. Wow. So. And, and tell me about the seniors and, and their uh, mix in this whole picture. Yeah, sometimes when I say, well, it's not children, it's adults, people assume right away that I'm, I'm meaning seniors, but I'm actually not. Seniors are at risk for poisonings. That's absolutely true, the same type of poisonings that affect adults and children. Um, but what we know is that the most people who die are actually middle-aged adults. Mm. So this is a, a, an issue for the whole family, starting at birth all the way through the senior years. With the the potential for poisoning is there. In seniors, some of the special issues that we, um, that we watch 
is medication safety, okay. obviously. So we see seniors taking a lot of medication. Um, they don't always know exactly what they're taking and why, so that can lead to too much, <laughs> wrong combinations, herbal supplements that they're buying at the health food store, mm. um, combining with very powerful prescriptions, and some of those combinations are harmful. Um, we also know that when seniors get poisoned, they are more likely to die because their bodies work more slowly, so their kidneys and their liver simply can't get rid of the poisons as fast or as effectively as, say, children's do. Children's bodies are able to really mm. fight back very effectively. Um, also, seniors m are more likely to have underlying health conditions, heart conditions, diabetes, that make it hard for their body to bounce back. And then, as you you brought some some items here, it's yes. not only medications. It's not it's only. It's also household items that you would have, and, and it's very surprising to see this. Yes. Well, these are what we call look-alike products. This is um, just an example um, of one type of product look-alike scenario mm -hmm. um, that can lead to poisoning in anyone. But mm -hmm. seniors are particularly at risk for this. So here is the, the drink, the juice. This is not a problem. Don't worry about drinking the juice. Sometimes <laughs> people are like, "What's wrong with cranberry juice?" Nothing. Um, but when you look at the cleaners, a lot of our cleaners um, yeah, have colors, to them. colors, similar packaging to the, the, yeah. the juices. It's true, they have fruits, fruits on it and Fruits on the label, exactly. So um, this is one of the more common scenarios that gives rise to someone getting a mouthful of something that they shouldn't be drinking. But let me ask you something, Wendy. Yes. Why, why would you, like, I've got a drawer or a cabinet that's just you know cleaning supplies exactly and then you know that would be in the pantry or in the refrigerator so what's going on there? exactly well what we see there are a few different things first of all we see people with limited storage jamming everything into one container or one cabinet so that gives rise what you've described is a good poison prevention strategy you have all of your cleaners up high mm -hmm. ideally um, so that children can't get into them in the home um, up high out of reach out of sight so you're already practicing a good uh, prevention strategy we know that a lot of these poisonings happen while they're in use. So the product will be out on the counter mm -hmm. and someone is either unpacking groceries or in the middle of using a product and they reach for one, maybe they've got a drink on the cabinet and the cleaner's right next to it and that's sort of another scenario where maybe it's not an actual wow. look-alike but it still ends up in the mouth. Um, a lot of products also have names now that sound edible. So we had a poisoning just in the last few weeks in, uh, in an adult. Uh, the woman drank a product called Vanilla Smoothie Hair Depilatory. Wow. Right? So imagine the packaging. You can bet it had a little vanilla bean on it. It probably smelled wow. appealing. And she drank it. And that was a call that we did have to refer to the hospital. So it was a potentially serious poisoning. So let me show you one other. This is, what, this is one particularly for children. Um, so you've got your Parmesan cheese. Children love Parmesan. And then you've got cleanser for the toilet. Um, and the packaging, again, similar shapes, colors. We see autistic children, in particular children with developmental disabilities who are using the shapes and the colors um, as a clue for what it is. Um, mm. But being able to read and being grown up enough doesn't necessarily protect you. We have seen seniors who mistook this for breadcrumbs, mistook this for cheese, wow. and you know ruined a batch of croquetas <laughs> for the family thinking they were helping. Um, vision problems, um, as we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. vision problems can lead uh, to some of that um, and you know also just unfamiliarity with new products okay and as far as the medication what you were saying vision problems what do you do? I mean, wh what can seniors do to prevent many of these things from happening? Well, the, the biggest thing we encourage um, anyone really, but seniors in particular, is to have a complete list of all the medications they're taking. Mm -hmm. So that's the start. So you have the medications, the amount you're taking, and what you're taking it for in a list. If you're not comfortable with paperwork and don't like doing lists, the other alternative is what we call a brown bag. You're coming up for your doctor's visit, you bring all your medications, you put it in a brown bag, you bring it and you dump it out at your visit. So the doctor can visually mm. assess all the things you're taking. You put your herbs in there, you put your vitamins in there, you even put your over-the-counter cough and cold or anything you're taking into that bag so that they can visually assess what's going on. Um, that's a big start because we, we find that patients assume that their multiple doctors are talking to each other. Mm. 
and we, we don't yet live in the world of a right. of a electronic medical record where it's easy for doctors to see what other doctors are prescribing for patients. Mm -hmm. So what we find is there's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of conflicts actually, and in some cases there are dangerous drug interactions happening without a patient even being aware. All right. Well, thank you, Wendy. Very good information to have. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and I also want to go then now over the, the numbers. Uh, okay, so the National Poison Helpline is 1-800-222-1222. And then when you call there, it, it will be transferred to the Florida Poison Information Center, which is at the medical campus at the University of Miami. And uh, But you've also got a website there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's www.miamipoison.org. And what type of information can they find online? We have a lot of information under our educational materials page. You can go there and download PDFs, uh, information, medication safety for seniors, um, prescription medication misuse. If you suspect you have someone in your home who's developed a dependency on one of these medications, this is really important information for you. Mm -hmm. um, also, how to keep children safe, how to poison proof your home, things about Florida snakes, about Florida insects, uh, all of that information is available for free, downloadable from that website. And then the, the finally, the last one is the American Association of Poison Control Centers and their website is www.aapcc dot org and what can they That's find right. there? Um, they are our umbrella organization, our parent organization if you will, um, and they oversee the 57 poison centers in the United States and they have information, all of our data comes to them so they're able to look at the nationwide picture of who's getting poisoned, where, and what we need to do about so it. So you could find statistics there as well? National t statistics, exactly. Well thank you so much, yes. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And coming up on Coral Gables now, at Actors Playhouse, there is a lot of detail that goes on into building the sets for their productions. We'll uncover some interesting facts when we return. Sun exposure starting in childhood is a major cause of skin cancer. That's why you should apply a high SPF sunscreen and keep your kids covered up whenever they're outside, not just at the beach or pool. Protect your children from the sun. They'll thank you for it someday. Welcome back. Last month, the Actors Playhouse wrapped up a very successful showing of Tracy Letts' Pulitzer Prize winning epic, August Osage County. And while the plot for uh, the plot and the actors took center stage, the actual set itself was a pretty incredible feat. Joining us today to talk about it is Actors Playhouse set designer Sean McClelland and artistic director David Arisco. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Thank you. Now, David, I want to start with you. Um, how how are the, the the productions decided on at the beginning of the season? How does that work? Well, it starts, I guess, with me as mm -hmm. artistic director of the theater. I go through a series of scripts and or see what else was playing in New York or around the country, what's mm -hmm. been successful regionally, uh, what I may have wanted to do for years that just excites me in general. And then I come up with a list. And then we run that list by the board and by executive director Barbara Stein and chairman of board uh, Larry Stein. And we all get together and uh, decide. You know, We try to pick a season that's varied. Uh, we normally do four musicals and two plays, but sometimes okay. that switches up. This year it was three musicals and three plays. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and when that is set, then, Sean, you take over? Or are you given the, the, some of the, the plays or the, the musicals to do then? We decide which ones uh, I'm going to be brought okay. in to do because I'm brought in as a freelance basis, and then me and Dave just kind of go off from there. But he is the fearless leader, and I just kind of follow <laughs> along. So, so, what do you do? Uh, do you have to read in order to prepare for for the set? Do you have to? Do you are you given the, the play? The script, I'm given the, the script or the musical okay. and or the music as well, and then I go off and read it a few times, mm -hmm. and then I start researching. I scour the internet, uh, try to nail the period or the. Uh, conceptualization that we might want to go for it then and then we and Dave just start talking we toss ideas around so is it something that you've you've got a guide or rules that you've got to stick by or are you given freedom to do whatever you want it all depends it all depends on the show some shows have a very strict guideline including this one um, that I need to follow as in these set locations are described we need to be in these locations 
Uh, some musicals like Les Mis, for example, you have to have the barricades. The audience expects it. Saigon, you have to have the helicopter. So there are some things that we just can't, you have to do. But other shows, I have a free drawing board. So it all depends. And it also comes down to the trust that I have with the director as well. And also Dave brings his ideas to the table. So I have to juggle that as well. So tell me about uh, Osage County. How, how was it? Uh, it was one of the biggest sets that Actors Playhouse has had. Um, what were the difficulties in, in doing it and just having such a huge set? Uh, almost the set itself was, it, it was a challenge of course, but the real challenge was not to copy the original. It won the Tony uh, for best set design uh, through Todd Rosenthal, he's a brilliant designer. It's almost iconic now. And it has a three-story house on stage and it's you have these set locations, so it's how to make it my own is really the challenge. And that was one of the things that we decided when I saw the show in New York, who else down here in South Florida could do the regional premiere of this show? And because of our space, mm -hmm. our, our 600 seat main stage theater, we have the height to be able to do the three story house, which a lot of theaters just can't do. So we entered into an arrangement to get the rights for the show, and then I knew I wanted to talk to Sean about the design for it. And we went through a series of how do we do this, how do we have the living room, the dining room, uh, the, how do we have the study, the second floor sitting room, the stairs, how do we make sure the sight lines can see everything that we need to as we get higher and higher. In the original, the set was back from the playing area. We decided to really envelop the actors more and really make it feel like we cut a house right in half mm -hmm. and you stepped right into it. That's exactly what it looks like. The idea was almost to suffocate the actors and just, this is their home, they can't escape from it. And uh, it was, the original was more like a dollhouse that was pushed up stage. Mm. And that was another challenge is how do you put a three-story house with all these rooms and still fit it on our stage? Because yeah. mm -hmm. it was really two and a half stories. And that was some tricks but I had to do. We had to, to cheat a little bit. <laughs> 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 and so how did it come together? Just uh, Was it in pieces? Did you build it on, on site? Um, everything was built in a shop, but it was in pieces and framework. And then uh, the shop and a crew of about ten carpenters uh, loaded in. And um, it just assembles there in front of you. The steel structure went up, and then um, all the pieces went on that. And then from there, I had to wallpaper and paint, and we all have to open it on time. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a challenge. That was certainly the challenge. Deadlines are deadlines <laughs> yeah. in theater. They're here. The, the audience comes that first night, whether you want them to or not. Yeah. <laughs> so David, how, how important is the set design for, for you in trying to get that, um, that impact? Well, every show, uh, sometimes lighting will be more important mm -hmm. to a show or sound will be yeah. more important to a show. Uh, in this particular show, the set was incredibly important. You really needed to feel like you were in this home with this family. And one of the elements that Sean came up with also was that the, uh, the, 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 the house would be in decay. It was tearing apart. Mm -hmm. It was at the framework, peeling back the wallpaper. And that's kind of what's happening to the family in the show uh, as we peel away the layers and we get down to the to the fact that this family is disintegrating, deteriorating before our eyes. So that was a little artistic catch of the, th of, of the play at the same time for the set. But the set can, can really dictate what I do and help me to create a, a more vivid reality for the audience. And now Actors Playhouse is uh, working on 39 Steps. That's soon to open. Sure. Um, tell me about that because it's not always that there's a set designed. Um... Well, 39 Steps is a completely different animal. 39 uh -huh. Steps is, first of all, it's going to be in our upstairs theater, which is our 300 seat space. Okay. And for the first time in a very long time, we entered into an arrangement with two other theater companies. Uh, we have to find out, I went to a Florida Professional Theater Association meeting a year ago and found out that a theater in Orlando and a theater in Fort Myers were also doing 39 Steps this year. We had all acquired the rights out of New York to do this play because it's four people, it's Hitchcock, it's fun. Four people play 150 characters mm. in the show. There's wicked fast costume changes. And the play is very pragmatic, very uh, just to kind of tell you where we are. Without, and it comes and goes and moves all in a, in a, in a, in a surround of the theater. You're, you're in a theater. So we're bringing in uh, a lot, the elements from the Orlando production and some of the actors with an additional actor who's done the show at another theater. And Jim Helsinger, who uh, is the artistic director of Orlando Shakespeare, is directing it, so it's uh, it's it's kind of bringing in some mm. fresh blood into the theater, and uh, and and I went and saw the production in Orlando. It was terrific, and mm -hmm. so ours will be based on that, but different. It's in our space. And some changes have to be made to the set, and we have some different actors doing it than who did it at the other production. Okay, and uh, so and you were saying that in summer you've got another one that Sean's going to be doing. Sean's actually doing a show. We're doing opening up with the fall, mm -hmm. and we open up with okay. Hairspray, which is our big Hairspray. musical for the fall. And Sean will be designing that. In the summer we have a brand new world premiere musical 
called See Jane Run, mm -hmm. uh, about the 21st century woman. Uh, it's fantastic. It's new. It's never been done anywhere. And uh, we're working with Dana Rowe and Mary Beth Graham, are the composers, writers of the piece. And we're very excited to do this piece in the summer. And then Hairspray is like, here we go yeah. again with a huge set. <laughs> it's going to be a huge set. And, and, right. and yeah. lots of people and crazy. You know, how do we take the Broadway Hairspray that then became the movie Hairspray? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the movie that became the Broadway musical that became the the musical movie and now bring it to the regional stage because we are even though we're big we're still smaller than when you go to see a show for the Broadway tour so it's a more intimate feeling show in our theater and the audience can really feel one on one with the actors even in the big musicals so so Sean have you started working on that on not history? yet not we're going to in a couple of weeks okay and, uh, so that's pretty pretty soon that you start working on those yes in advance Absol absolutely and um, the idea is it you almost need like a month incubation period and, mm. and when we're tossing about ideas and then I start in the schematics and doing ground plans and get the blocking straight and this and that because everything has to be done drawing wise first you don't want to just show up in the shop get it <laughs> built and then Dave goes on stage and be like this isn't what we agreed to and uh, that's really the contract that I give him is my renderings and my schematics yeah, yeah we have to see everything and then uh, we have to be able to visualize right it. that's one of the hardest things for uh, some directors and choreographers is being able to see what's on paper and figure out how all that's going to work in 3D reality mm -hmm. on stage. And sometimes models are built for the director so they have a little oh, clearer understanding. Cool. And Sean can work in models, but we have a kind of shorthand where we don't really need that mm -hmm. as much as he gives me his color renderings. Uh, I see some of the different elements of how stuff is going to come and go. Then I talk to my tech director about where we're going to store this stuff backstage <laughs> so that it comes on it because we don't have traditional wings and flies. Most theaters, you know, the pieces can come yeah. from above or they can come in from the sides. We have very, very small little su uh, su wings or what, 10 feet on one side and wow. maybe 12 on the other, and we don't have a fly space, even though the Miracle Theater looks like it does. It doesn't. We can bring in some pieces, uh, eight-foot headers and things of that nature, to suggest that we have a fly system. But mm. uh, And so sometimes we use turntables. Uh, different different devices to to move the scenery so that it becomes very fluid and very cinematic and the segues are all like right on the money all right pretty rewarding stuff absolutely I love what I do all right well thank you both of you oh and I have to mention that David just won a Carbonell I did. tell me tell me ah. tell me for what for well, we were nominated for a bunch of Carbonos uh -huh. for, Miss, for Miss Saigon, a production that we did last year. And, and I won for Best Director, and Eric Alsford won for Best Musical Direction, and the lead actor uh, won for the gentleman who did The Engineer, Herman, won for Best Actor. So we, uh, we had this gentleman here who won last year for Les Mis, but we Les weren't Mis, lucky enough wow. to have him win for Saigon. But they'll be, they'll be talking about August Osage County next year at the exactly. Carbonos, I'm, I'm sure. Exactly. I'm sure. I'm sure they will. Well, congratulations to both of Thank you. you. Very nice, and of course, always award-winning uh, uh, Actors Playhouse. I've seen them, uh, and all the all the beautiful plays that you guys do. Thank you, thank you so much. Musicals, and let me just say that Alfred Hitch Hitchcock's Thirty Nine Steps is playing uh, from May eleventh through June fifth at the Actors Playhouse at Miracle Theater. And then, uh, if you want to see any show times, the dates, ticket prices, all that, you can call the box office, and that's at three zero five four 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 nine two nine three. You can also visit their website. It's actorsplayhouse.org. And we'll be right back with your Mother's Day messages. And that does it for this edition of Coral Gables Now. Thanks for watching Coral Gables Television. And because May is the month that we celebrate our mothers, we leave you now with your messages to mom. See you next month. Happy Mother's Day, Irene. Ha Happy Mother's Day to mom. I love you so much. You give me all I need. Feliz Dias de Madres. Gracias por todo. Tu hace para mi y para mi familia. Hi, hi, hi Sharon. I love you. Have a happy Mother's Day. I love you so much. I'm going to make you the biggest part ever.
Have happy Mother's Day, Mom.